Well, thank you, Tommy, for reading from Jeremiah chapter 36, which gives us a bit of background to our hidden figure tonight. But I'm going to be preaching from Jeremiah chapter 45, so you can make your way over to Jeremiah 45. Jeremiah 45, verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. You said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I'm weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built up, I am breaking down, and what I have planted, I am plucking up. That is the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. Well, I'm sure you'd agree. As one of the major prophets, Jeremiah is a well-known character. He's well-known as the weeping prophet, in fact. His was a terrible commission to prophesy to Israel their coming defeat at the hands of the Babylonians. His was the commission to prophesy the fall of Jerusalem and the temple and their coming lengthy exile away from their beloved promised land and away from the temple of the Lord, which was the presence of God. This judgment was coming as a result of their spiritual apostasy and adultery. And so not only did Jeremiah have the unenviable task of bringing bad news certainly unwelcome news, and even some news which some considered to be treasonous and damaging to morale. Not only was that Jeremiah's onerous commission, but Jeremiah would be bringing this news to a people who would harden their hearts and close off their ears to Yahweh's prophets. They would respond to his prophecies with hostility and with unbelief, further sealing their judgment from the Lord. Now, although Jeremiah spoke on behalf of the Lord, Alone, he wasn't totally alone. He was served and supported by a faithful Jewish scribe named Baruch. Now, despite the fact that Baruch has quite a cool name, we don't really know much about Baruch, except for the fact that he penned down the prophecies of Jeremiah, and he often, in fact, we read in in chapter 36 of how he courageously presented those prophecies at times on Jeremiah's behalf. Jeremiah's prophetic career spanned the reign of five kings and led him from the land of Israel all the way south and finally back to Egypt where he, in fact, died. Jeremiah's was a hard ministry. He witnessed and experienced the humiliation and defeat of Israel and their voluntary exile and their return to Egypt, a reversal of the great exodus. Jeremiah's task was full of lamentation, and no doubt he was brought to the end of himself at many times. Baruch, as his faithful scribe and disciple, no doubt experienced much lamentation himself, and probably also experienced times where he really felt like he had nothing more to give, that he had been spread too thin. He had been with Jeremiah through thick and thin. He had felt the sting of rejection from his countrymen, And he had hoped for great things, and yet he faced scorn and contempt and unbelief continuously. And Baruch expresses his lamentation in chapter 45, verse 3, saying, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I'm weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. So he was there to comfort Jeremiah, but who was there to comfort him? What reward would Baruch receive for his faithful service to the Lord in tough times, you might be wondering. From this, I think we can learn three important lessons that the Scripture teaches us from the life of Baruch. And the first lesson that I want us to learn tonight is the fact that the Christian life and ministry is often painful. Christian life and ministry is often painful. Very often we find ourselves buying into a type of prosperity gospel, which says that if we spend our time regularly in the Word and in prayer, and if we diligently seek to obey the Lord, turning away from evil, 
if we're honest and we're merciful and we serve the Lord and His body, then somehow life will go well for us. I mean, surely if I'm denying myself and I'm taking up my cross and I'm following Jesus, surely there should be a smoothish road along my voluntary path of suffering and self-denial. Yes, I may not have the house and car that I would like, but surely ministry and church life should be easy. We find ourselves questioning God when we're hit with wave after wave of disappointments, hardships and twists and turns which leave us apparently worse off. We lose friends. We lose employment. We find ourselves in conflict with family members. We face a negative diagnosis or we receive a poor grade at school or university. We face the loss of a loved one and we wonder, why? Why, Lord? Now that very question implicitly assumes that there is a reason in ourselves. This reasoning goes, if I'm doing my best, why do bad things keep happening to me? For those involved in ministry, in spite of your best efforts at communication, you find you're misunderstood. You face backstabbing. Those whom you thought you could count on prove to have feet of clay. You're slandered. Your ministry doesn't grow. In fact, it shrinks. People keep cancelling at the last minute. After you pour your heart and soul into a lesson or a sermon, people nitpick on some slip of the tongue or harp on a peripheral matter, seemingly having missed the main point. The truth is that there is no guarantee of ease in the Christian life. Yes, we know from Ecclesiastes, wisdom is always better than folly, and it's always better to do justice and live righteously than it is to do evil. But we know that even Jesus, even the Son of God, faced hardship and disappointment. Even Jesus, who left his glory to come and redeem sinners such as you and I. He who did the most selfless and praiseworthy thing, was known as the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we ought not to expect that our life or ministry will be any different. The Christian life and ministry is often painful. And because we are only the instruments, very often the outputs are not directly related to the inputs. There can be faithful inputs and the outputs can be disappointing. The Christian life and ministry is hard, and Baruch had to learn that lesson, and so should we. But secondly, from Baruch, we want to learn to beware of the sin of pride. We want to learn to beware of the sin of pride. From verse 5. Now, as, as we've gone through some of these overlooked or hidden figures in Scripture, the goal has been that we not only follow their example, but we also learn from their failings. We can examine the ways in which they served the Lord and see how the Lord dealt with them. And the reason for this is that there is much that we can learn from these men and women because very often they're a lot easier for us to identify with as seemingly ordinary men and women than some of the heroes of the faith. And the goal tonight is no different. I trust you can see that Baruch was a man much like you and I. He was a background figure. He wasn't a prophet. He didn't receive a word directly from the Lord that he was supposed to declare to the people saying, thus saith the Lord. He's like us in this respect, that he was tempted to be prideful. Baruch complains, woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I'm weary with my groaning and I find no rest. And the Lord responds directly to Baruch saying, thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built up, I am breaking down, and what I have planted, I am plucking up, that is the whole land. Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Seek them not. Now this word from the Lord to Baruch in this entire book of Jeremiah might seem a little strange. But let's consider Baruch for a moment. We don't know a whole lot about him, so we must use some sanctified imagination, drawing deductions from what we do know. Now, we know that he was a Jew, and we know that he was a scribe. Scribes in Israel were something like modern-day seminary students. They were being trained in the law, the Torah. Think of how often that group of, of people, religious leaders, was mentioned with the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, so often in the New Testament. And they were related. They were religious experts. They were teachers of the law. 
The scribes and the Pharisees, we know, have a rather poor reputation to New Covenant Christians because of their hypocrisy around the time of Jesus' ministry. But we need to be careful not to paint the entire group with the same brush. Just because there are pastors who are hypocrites in today's world doesn't mean that we assume that every pastor is a hypocrite. No, rather, judging by Baruch's actions and his courageous support of Jeremiah, the true prophet of God, we can ascribe to Baruch a sincere desire to serve the Lord. He probably went into ministry with aspirations of helping the people of Israel to worship the Lord rightly and to grow in holiness and to look forward to the coming Messiah. And yet this was not the ministry that God had designed for Baruch, was it? Baruch was not to be a famous revival preacher or some shining academic. He would not be an ancient version of George Whitfield or Albert Moeller. No, his lot was to prophesy the wrath and judgment of Yahweh on an apostate and hard-hearted people. And no one likes a prophet of doom. No one likes to be told that they're wrong. People don't write biographies about men who draw attention to their sins. We, like Baruch, have aspirations, and we often feel that we deserve some sort of reward for our labors. Indeed, we know from Scripture, ambition itself is not wrong. We see in 1 Timothy 3 how Paul says that he who desires the office of no overseer desires a noble task. So that desire is a good thing. We see in Romans 2, again, Paul speaking of a good sort of ambition, saying he will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality he will give eternal life. So in other words, there are good ambitions and desires for Christians. They are good and praiseworthy. And yet all desire, if it is self-serving, becomes prideful and idolatrous. Back to Romans 2, right after Paul has spoken of this good ambition, he says, he warns us against an ungodly ambition by saying, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So did you see that? Those who are self-seeking. Godly ambition is all about desiring to serve God by serving His people. All self-seeking ambition is evil and ultimately destructive. Now it would seem that Baruch, even in the midst of doing an excellent job of serving Jeremiah, even in the midst of his suffering, and obedience, he was tempted toward this sort of self-serving ambition, forgetting that the servant of God, the, the man of God, must be willing to take up his cross and follow the Messiah, it would seem that Baruch found himself dissatisfied, wanting more. Now, it may be easy for us to sit here, and I certainly do feel a sense of disappointment at Baruch, but are we not prone ourselves to that same sort of self-seeking ambition? That self-seeking sin, I know I certainly am. The Lord says to him, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. And no doubt the Lord speaks the same words to us through this recorded prophecy. Another reason that Baruch was not to seek great things for himself was that he belonged to a people who had been faithless to their God. Faithless to their God. Their Lord who had done so much to them, taking their forefather Abraham out of the pagan land of the Ur of the Chaldees, where he was a heathen, making a nation of this family in Egypt, ultimately saving them from their enslavement to the Egyptians, conquering enemies, establishing a kingdom. These Israelites had turned away from their Savior to serve the gods of other nations. And as a result, the Lord was visiting judgment on the nation by sending them into exile. And Baruch was a part of this nation. Although he was not personally guilty of these sins, perhaps, he was still a part of a faithless covenant people, which highlights the effects of sin within a covenant community, doesn't it? The sin of the Israelites was going to have a profound and life-changing effect and impact on Baruch. He, too, would suffer the effects of the destruction of the nation he too would ultimately go into exile. The same reality is true for us within the church. Sin within a church affects everyone, either through becoming complicit in that sin 
or by lowering our view of holiness like it did with the Corinthian church, or by the consequences of sin being felt by everyone who is covenantly connected. Think of the pain and the destruction that comes within a church when one of its pastors must step aside from the ministry due to the sin of adultery. Think of the pain and suffering that is caused by divorce or by substance abuse or even that slow fade, that lack of gathering with the body which at first leads to the spiritual lukewarmness and ultimately to turning away entirely. The sins of those within the covenant community have far-reaching effects. And we see how the Lord tells Baruch that far from Israel flourishing in the immediate future, he was planning to destroy and uproot them. And so we must be aware of the sin of pride. Beware of all sin, but particularly as you serve within the church, beware of the sin of pride. When you're tempted to take offense or to feel aggrieved or angry or hurt or overlooked, regardless of how legitimate that sense of or that sin against you might have been, take a long, hard look into the recesses of your heart and you'll be surprised at how often at the very bottom you'll find the core of the sin of pride lurking. At the bottom of that emotional response is pride. Beware of the sin of pride. But finally, notice from Jeremiah 45 that there is a reward for faithful servants. There is a reward for faithful servants. The Lord says to Baruch, I'm bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord, but I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. Yes, Baruch, you need to watch out for the sin of pride in your heart. Yes, Baruch, you've experienced pain and pain on top of sorrow, and you'll continue to feel that pain and sorrow as long as you live, as the whole land is plucked up and destroyed. But see the grace of God, who is not unjust to overlook the faithful service that you have rendered. The faithful service of a flawed sinner like Baruch. The Lord grants to Baruch his life. And that might not seem like such a something to be so joyful about. I mean, you get your life. And yet when we realize that Baruch, while perhaps not apostate like his fellow Jews, even Baruch and Jeremiah, for that matter, were both sinners at best. They were the best of men, but sinners at best. When we realize that Israel was merely living out a physical caricature of the inner spiritual apostasy which every son of Adam has enacted when he put himself on the throne when he sinned against the Lord, when we realize that the wages for sin is death, then we realize that Baruch, as a sinner, deserved to die. Just as we deserve to die. We too have turned away from the Lord and gone our own way. We too have pride in our hearts. We too deserve to die. And yet, like Baruch, there is reward in obedience. There is grace for sinners like you and I. Baruch was faithful in spite of his complaint, and we too can be faithful. Not by trying harder, mind you, not by trying harder. We've all been there and we've tried, and we know it doesn't work. It doesn't work because we're rotten to the core and our hearts incline us to sin at all times. But instead of trying harder to keep the law and find ourselves failing at one point and then becoming guilty of all of it, we need only to obey one command. Acts 17.30, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And 1 John 3.23, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Is it not amazing that the Lord, who saves us from our sin and rebellion against him, would go further and reward us by making us sons and daughters of God, not only forgiving us, but adopting us? blessing us with so much more than we deserve. That's amazing when we think of how a thousand life, lifetimes spent serving the Lord would not be enough to erase our guilt. Yet God promises to give those with godly ambitions eternal life. Brothers and sisters, though we are weak, though we are sinners who deserve death, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we too can not only have our lives as a prize of war, but we can enjoy everlasting joy and fellowship with the Father as the children of God 
and fellow heirs with Christ if we will stop trying to earn God's favor or put him in our debt by attempting to prove ourselves righteous. But when we will humbly confess that we are sinners and by faith obey the call to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be saved to sin no more. Baruch was a good man. He was an admirable man in many respects. He was a man that we can all identify with, I trust. He wasn't some great prophet. He wasn't someone who commanded extraordinary respect. His name was not to be remembered for generations for his valiant acts of faith. But he is a man much like you and I. He reminds us that the Christian life and ministry are often painful. This is normal and we should expect it. He reminds us to beware of the sin of pride. And he reminds us of the grace of God in the gospel. So may the Lord help us to be faithful servants, no matter the circumstances, because we are not self-seeking, but we live and serve for the glory of God and the good of his people. Well, let's pray. Lord, how encouraging it is that you use ordinary people, that you use flawed people. How encouraging it is that you not only forgive those who are repentant, but through the Lord Jesus Christ you adopt them into your family as sons and daughters of God. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to be aware of the sin of pride. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to persevere in spite of hardship in ministry. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to worship you for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.